and they sent me like 15 cases of Red Bull, I want to say, maybe 20 right, cases of Red Bull at some point. My friends made a throne out of it for me and I sat on it and there's a video. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's David Bombal back with a very special guest, very well known in the hacking community. Ben, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm calling you Ben now, but what's your, your handle that you typically use and give us a bit of background of yourself. Yeah, my name is Ben Sadegapur. Most people online know me as Nahamsek. Um, I've been doing bug bounties or hacking as a profession since 2014. People may have seen me from hacking companies like Apple, Red Bull, Airbnb, Lyft, Snapchat. Uh, I've hacked the Department of Defense a few times, which was really fun. I also create content to help mentor and get people into the door with hacking and kind of show them how it changed my life and they could do the same with hacking as well. I was hoping that you could give us a demonstration of like, how do you get started in bug bounty? You know, some of the platforms and sort of like a walk through of that would that be possible yeah absolutely i can give you a walk through we can talk about different platforms you know how do people get started yeah that'd be great ben if you could take it away talk us through it and give us your advice i mean you've been doing this for a long time cool so when it comes down to bug bounties there are three key players there are multiple players i don't want to say there's only three but there are multiple platforms three of them are my favorite there's hacker one there's bug crowd and there's Integrity. There are also platforms like Synac, Yes We Hack, Munify, there's a bunch of other ones. These are the three that I personally hack on. I've been a little bit biased with uh, HackerOne itself. I used to work at HackerOne for a while. I've been there for six years. Why do you prefer these three? Is it, And I mean, this is, we'll just say this. This is your personal opinion. This video is not sponsored by anyone. You can say whatever you like. So you yeah, know, absolutely. just give us your opinion. There are different reasons. One is they're more established in the community. So the, these three are very heavily involved in the community. Uh, companies like Senac, you have to pass a test. You have to do an interview with them. It's a little bit harder to get into get into the Senac Red team, which is good and bad. If it's good because that means there's limited hackers on their team, but it's bad because not everyone could get started. But with these three, especially with Hacker One, it's just the, the program selection, the bounty amounts, the the companies that are on there. There's the staff, the teams, uh, the support staff, and all that good stuff. So I'll give you an example of like the big companies that are on each one. The Department of Defense is on Hacker One, Airbnb is on Hacker One. Tesla is on Bug Crowd and Red Bull, and I believe Intel are both also on Integrity. So they're big, big players on both of these, uh, on three of these companies. And you can see all the list of all their programs here. For this is for Integrity, they have the WordPress engine, for example. Um, you see all these companies. And again, they're very focused on Europe. So if you're in Europe and you want to hack on European brands, this should be probably your go to if you want to just primarily focus on that. But they're going to be branching out to different countries as well. But most of these, if you know their products, you know, it's easier to hack on them than um, a company you don't know. Next one, Bug Crowd, same thing. Uh, you go to programs. This is before you sign up. If you just want to browse, uh, you can see they have one password, a password manager, pen, uh, Pinterest. Uh, let's see who else to have. The Railroad Retirement Board, some of the government's program, HostGator. Um, lots of lots of different companies. They have more and more here. Um, they're not showing all of them, unfortunately. You can see right here, it says promoted. But you can filter them based on the industry, based on you know max reward submissions. Uh, same thing with Hacker One. Uh, Hacker One's a little bit more hidden. You have to go to this page called Directory. Directory, if I can spell it right. And right here, Directory is gonna take a while, but you can see all of these different programs that they also offer. You can see what their bounty amounts are if you want to sort them by the bounty amount. So we we'll sort it by bounties. So just for people who are new, the bounty is what you could possibly earn as that right? Correct. And I will do a rundown of what everything means in just right. a sec. I want right. to kind of just uh, show these. You can also, if you're good at mobile hacking, iOS, you know, for iPhone, you can go here. If you're Android hacker, you can filter by it and that stuff. But before we jump into it, yeah, I think uh, it would be fair for me to talk about a few things that are very important when it comes out to bug bounties. There's some terminology that I think everyone should know. Yeah. One is, yeah. what is bug bounty, first of all? Like, what is this bug bounty thing we're talking about? Uh, bug bounties allow anybody, uh, whether you're a professional, you're a security professional, you're an ethical hacker, you're a beginner, it allows you to hack on a company, test their security, uh, and the security of their products and their digital assets, as long as you play within a scope of their program. And they pay you in a return or they may give you some goods or they may not pay you and just recognize you for your work. 
Some people like doing the recognition. It's a good place to put on your resume. For example, companies like IBM, Department of Defense, Ford, uh, GM, they don't pay you, but if you hack them, they'll put you on their leaderboard that says, hey, they have hacked on our program. They are uh, who they say they are, and you know they get recognized. Ripple actually offered uh, Red Bull cases. If you look, go on one of my social media accounts, you'll see say, me I saw, sitting. I saw your video about Red Bull. What, 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 what was that video? You'll have to talk us about. Tell us about it. Yeah, so I hacked Red Bull when they launched a bug bounty program, just purely out of fun. I like the, yeah. I like the aspect of just hacking a company for the bragging rights. But I don't yeah. put too much time and effort into it. It's just more of a, I want to say I did it. It was an experience yeah. thing, right? And they sent me like 15 cases of Red Bull, I want to say. Maybe 20 cases of Red Bull at some point. My friends made a throne out of it for me and I sat on it and did a video um, for fun. So that's also another case, right? You don't, It's not always monetary. Some of these gifts are valued more than money in some cases. Um, another one is like the United Airlines has their own bug bounty program, not on any of these platforms, which is also common. Like Google, Facebook, and like United Airlines have their own bug bounty programs off of these platforms uh you know that airlines give you gives you uh airline miles so when you hack on them you can get fifty thousand miles all the way to a million uh, i know hackers who had like millions and millions of miles i got a couple hundred thousand and i flew to like europe and back which was really really fun so you can do stuff like that with it what's one of the most exciting ones that you've done and which is one that's made you the most money and i'm, I'm not sure if you can share but like kind of the money that you were able to make out of this I will show how you can see everyone's reports at some point through this interview okay, or this great. video. But for me personally, I went on this journey, I want to call it, with a friend of mine, Serafino Brocious, uh, aka Dakin. Give her a follow on Twitter. Amazing hacker, probably one of the most brilliant minds you will see out there. Her and I were just wanting to hack some of these big companies. So we hacked Lyft, Snapchat, and a big hospitality travel company that I cannot name, unfortunately. But if you go on my profile, it's very obvious who they are. We were looking at a particular functionality on all these companies, and all three were vulnerable. Um, and that just gave us a lot of money and also allowed us to talk at DEF CON. The only reason why I said that was one of the most fun things I've done is I learned a lot throughout the process. It wasn't so much a monetary aspect. I collaborated with Serafina, which was really, really fun. But it was just the, the method we were saying, hey, we can hack these particular functionality on these random sites. Can we do it to big organizations? and it did work it was the same method uh, and it worked out uh, i mentioned scope earlier uh, that's really important to understand what a scope is so i'm going to actually go to uh, the yahoo program the yahoo program is known as the beginners program for a lot of the old school hackers like myself who are very new to bug bounties because uh, yahoo google and facebook were probably the only companies offering a bounty in 2014 uh, but this is what it looks like for every company and honestly if you even let's go to bug crap i want to show you. it looks all similar the layouts are different, but they all look almost similar. The bounty amounts are up here for buck wrap, buck for hacker ones in the corner. But I want to show that they all show this information to you. And you really should read it. This is very important because this is how they set up expectations. This is how they tell you, hey, this is what we want you to do. This is what we don't want you to do. This is what we pay you. This is how much you'll, you know, the max payout is. And it gives you metadata on the program itself too. So from the top right here, you see the rewards. If you find something with low criticality, they're going to give you $100. And if you do something critical, it's minimum is uh, $10,000. But if we scroll down right here, you can see the top bounty range is between $6,000 and $40,000. That means somebody has gotten a single bounty worth $40,000 from Yahoo before. And you can see how much they paid in the last 90 days. You can see if it's an active program and a total amount made. That's great. Total bounties paid almost $22 million, which is insane. Wow. Wow. But yeah, so this is, you know, it tells you the table of contents. Uh, some companies may be smaller, like it might be shorter, and some companies are a lot bigger. So here it tells you like, hey, uh, if you're hacking, you need to add these things to your request. Uh, this is, you know, a must do. If you find a particular vulnerability, this is what you need to do with it. They tell you everything you need to know, and they explain the information here as well. They tell you what's, uh, what's considered as a medium, what's considered as a critical, and then all the way, all these rules. And right here is what's in scope of the program. So if you see these domains right here, it says... This domain, data.mail.com, is considered critical, so that's an important asset to them, and it is eligible for a bounty, so that means they're going to pay you, versus this one is a medium. While they may pay you a bounty, it's not as important to them, so the bounty range is going to stop at a medium, and then all the way at the bottom right here, you're going to see some of these domains. There's a lot of them for Yahoo. That says it's critical. You can report to them. It's, not, it's still in scope, like vzbuilders.com, but it's not eligible for a bounty. So they will not pay you for it if you find a vulnerability. These assets are there on a, what we call the see something, say something basis. So if you randomly find a vulnerability, you want to be responsible and disclose it. You should be responsible and disclose it. You go here and report it, but you shouldn't expect. Sometimes they may pay you, they may give you a bonus, but don't expect to get paid. But you could get bragging rights, yeah? 
Yeah, and then out of scope means please don't hack on these things. Don't touch them. Uh, Yahoo.net is very much like third party for Yahoo. A lot of the third party services on there. Same thing with Yahoo.com. TW and all these different ones. So that means please do not test these and don't go after them at all. So you know what scope is now. You know what the policy looks like. There's some other information on the right hand side right here. Uh, again, Buckrat has similar ones. It shows you the vulnerability re rewarded. You know how many days it takes. You know, how much they've paid in average. Same thing here, but it's it's more. They tell you you know average time to a bounty is about a month. So if you report something to them, it may take them a month before they pay you. Um, you can see what their average bounty amount is. Last report they resolved was yesterday, and you can also see all of the hackers who have hacked on this program historically. You can see all time hackers who are up here, or you can go and see the start of the program in 2014 or 2013 uh, and see who was hacking on their programs as they were uh, submitting bugs and receiving more and more vulnerabilities. And you can see this, these names just change drastically every year. But there's a few other things that I really want to highlight on uh, each of these. One is if you like a particular hacker, I'm going to use my own profile as an example. You can click on their profile. It gives you information. Um, this clear verified means they've been verified and background checked by Hacker One. This is mostly for the customers, but it also tells you this person is a real person. So it's not someone claiming to be me just like they would do on other social media platforms. You can see the social media links, which it's not that important, honestly, but this is where the good stuff happens. This is called the activity, which you can see the activity based on a user's profile, on a customer profile, and also you can see it based on the entire platform. The activity is pretty much the hacker's activity, as it sounds, activity, and you can see all their vulnerabilities that they have chosen to disclose. So right here you can see, go to disclosed, it shows you all the vulnerabilities that I have disclosed with some of the information. So you can click on it. And again, I'm not registered on this platform yet. I haven't logged in yet. So you can see the conversation I've had with this company, what we found, what the back and forth look like, all the way through the bounty amount and what their expectation was and why they paid that much. You can see all of it pretty much. And it tells you, you know, what went wrong, what went great, whatever it is. Now you can see all of that. And on the right hand side, you can see more of the metadata, all the people that were involved. So all these different security folks that were involved in this process and some of the hackers who were also involved while we reported this. And you so can it's, totally, it's very transparent, isn't it? There's a lot so, of it's yes. very transparent. Yeah. One of our one of the uh hacker one values is to be trans transparency is very important to us. Yeah. And it goes through with our programs as well. But it's also an educational thing. We want people to learn. Hackers yeah. really like teaching each other, and this yeah. is one of those things of you know this one of those ways to do it. So you can see some of the you know some of the programs that I've hacked on that I've disclosed. But if you wanted to see more of them, you can actually go at the bottom of my page and you can click on View More, and this shows all of the programs that I've submitted to. So you can see I was actively hacking on Airbnb for a while. I've been dethroned as number one to number two. Uh, I've hacked Valhoe, so number one, I'm number three. Rockstar game, same thing. Yahoo, I've gone to 66. You name it, Yelp, Snapchat. I've hacked on these programs, localized. And Is that can, rating based on number of rack, oh, sorry, number of hacks discovered? Or, or, so number or of vulnerabilities, unpaid. correct. So um, number of vulnerabilities. Okay. So you can yep. see out of my 70 reports to Airbnb, 59 were valid. Yeah. Uh, and they've given me this much reputation. The reputation point is what makes a difference uh, in the leaderboard. And then, you know, 54 out of 55 with Valve, and then 32 out of 37 and all that stuff. So you can see my activity on all these, like two out of five with Snapchat and all of that stuff. So this is just on my basis of like my, you know, me personally as a hacker. But let's say you wanted to look at a company. You wanted to see what kind of vulnerabilities does this company have? You can do the same thing. You go to a profile, hack, hacker one, you go to activity, you click on disclosed, and it shows you all of these different vulnerabilities that have been disclosed to Hacker One. You can see if they were low, how much were they paid, what the title was, and click on them and read them. So you can also see the interaction with this team as well. So it doesn't have to be always just the same hacker, it could just be based on the program. But if you really want to learn, and this is something that I you know, recommend to everybody as to read the activity feed is, you can actually go to hackerone.com slash activity. You can look at these and you can go to disclosed and you can see all of the different programs. And all the companies are on Hacker One publicly. You can see TikTok, for example, 14 days ago they disclosed this. You can click on it and read it. And this is one of the best ways to honestly learn. So sometimes I don't disclose the whole thing. They give you a general idea of how it worked. So you can't see all of it. But honestly, it gives you an idea of how to do these things. Um, you get to understand what kind of vulnerabilities they have. And the same thing with Buckcrowd. You can see there's CrowdStream. 
Uh, you can click on Disclose Reports, and you can see Supplement Takeover for this government website. Um, Log for Shell, which was huge. You can see um, someone disclosed it to the Department of Interior. And if they have disclosed it fully, you can also read the entire thing. You can see That's great because you've got all the history of like what people are actually doing. Um, correct. And you can see the submissions as well. So you can see how to you know, write a report, is that right? Or get correct, an idea of yeah. what to do. Yeah. yeah. It gives you an idea of you know, what did they include for it. This is exactly what it would look like for a hacker too when they submit it to this program. So you can see all of their information right here as well. And it, you know, log for shade log for J was huge, you know, not too long yeah. ago. And people here could literally see how this found this person found it. Where it was an injection point, it was in this base right here. And how did they catch it? They used this net cat and it came back and you can see the entire interaction and then what the you know, what the company said, what the hacker said, and then um, the entire interaction of its own as well. If you're new and you want to get into bug bounties, uh, Hacker One has this company called uh, Hacker 101. So if you go to Hacker 101, uh, you will need a Hacker One account. But this is where you can learn. You can go to getting started. You can learn different, you know, how to get started, what is, how to write a good report, how to ask for help. But even better, you can go to videos right here. And you can see Stoke, and I interviewed Stoke recently. He did a video for Hacker 101 on JavaScript for hackers. Uh, that's featured right here. But you can see all of our different content here. So if you want to learn about web hacking, there's all the different content you can learn. Uh, if you want to learn from some of our top hackers, we have done two seasons of Mentorship Monday. You can look at how to pen test. You will see our guest, uh, myself and Ari, uh, when we interviewed them. And that's a really good place to start and also learn from others in the industry as well. So I highly recommend going to Hacker 101 to learn. But the best part of it is, is the CTF site, which is behind a login. But once you get a Hacker 1 account and you go on Hacker 101 uh, and play a CTF, what happens is if you solve the CTF levels, if you solve 26 points, so put it this way, each flag in each level has a, def, has, a, has a certain number of points. It goes anywhere from six points to 26 points, for example, right? If you get 26 points, that equals one private invitation. So all the programs that I've shown you aren't the programs that are out there. These companies have private programs that are only open to a small number of hackers. So they get invited privately so instead of the whole world being able to see it, like some of these programs that I showed you, like TikTok, for example, when anyone in the world could hack on them, these program, programs are designed to stay private for people that haven't been given the privilege to get invited to hack on it. So you can get those invites if you go to Hacker 101 and solve all of the CTFs. The more CTFs you solve, the more points you get, and the more points you get, it equals to more invites as well. How do I start? You know, Let's say I want to hack the... PayPal or government website, what do, what do I do? You go to hackerone.com, you click login, you create an account. So let's just make one. Uh, obviously, we're a hacker. Uh, I'm going to put Ben Nahamsek. Uh, Naham, uh, I think not Nahamsek is already taken by me. Well, let's try it. Not Nahamsek2. Uh, you want to give it an email address. Let's see if my email works. You want to give it a password. I'm going to give it a password here. And we're going to create an account. And hopefully, this works. Once you make your account, you you will see something similar to this. We may put you in the hacker dashboard. I'm not sure, but if you get lost, just always click on the top and go to your hacker dashboard. So this is what it looks like when you log in. It shows you a number of different things. It shows your stats. It shows the number of vulnerabilities you found. Uh, you can go to my programs. So this is where your private invites would show if you had anything. Uh, if you have any invites already, go to pending invites. But I want to talk about a few things in this setting. Let's start with the settings first. First of all, the settings, you know, very straightforward. If you want to upload your avatar, you want to put your name, uh, your username, your website location, anything you want to give up, it's not required, but you're welcome to put that information there. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of these things. Uh, the most important thing here is your tax documentation. If you want to get paid at some point, they're going to send you a link. It's going to show up somewhere in here. You have to fill out your tax documents. I don't think I have that on here because this is not my main account. But I think on the payments tab is where it's going to ask you uh, to do this. So you can it's a sign a tax form. You can click on it. And you won't get paid until you do that. So make sure you do that before um, you get paid. But invitation preference. This is very important. If you want to receive invites to private programs, you have to make sure this is on. This is on by default usually, 
but I can't stress it enough. I want to make sure it's on. You can always turn it off if you don't want to. If you don't like cryptocurrency programs like I do, I don't like hack on cryptocurrency programs. I don't want to hack on any of those. You can turn it off. And if you have a preference on how much money you want to make, you can also change that. Uh, but I think they don't allow you to do this until your bounty average is a little bit higher than this. But once you make a little bit of money, you can change that uh, right here. There is something I want to make sure I highlight, and a lot of people don't know this. It's it's not really private information, but it's also not something that newbies know. If you do finish one of the CTFs and you get an invite and you don't like it, you go to the program on the bottom right corner of the page. I can't show that, unfortunately, on the stream, but if you go to the bottom right of the program, um, I'm going to pull up a fake program. Uh, at some, you know, in the bottom, it says leave program somewhere here. It's going to say leave program and a pink button. Click that. There's going to be a survey. If you fill in that survey and you leave the program or you decline the invite, you don't want to, you know, if you don't have to accept every invite. If you want to decline it, and, but if you fill in that survey, what will happen is they will send you another invite within 48 hours. So you can recycle through those. Just because you've been given a program and you don't like it, it's not the end of the world. Leave the program or decline it because when you get an invite, you can actually see what the program looks like. It shows you, you know, it shows you some of this metadata at the top. It tells you what company it is. If you don't like it, decline the invite, get another one. So I just want to make sure people understand That's that. That's good advice, yeah. yeah. You don't have to hack on these programs. You're getting one invite, make a count for yourself. Now, let's say you wanted to hack on a company like TikTok. So let's say you have found the vulnerability, you've read all of these uh, scope information, you found the bug. What do you do? You go up here and you click on Submit Report. And here you get to pick the asset you found the vulnerability. The star.tiktok.com means that the asset you found sits on tiktok.com. So it could be ads.tiktok.com, it could be test.tiktok.com. That goes all here. And the specific ones like ads, business, you can select them right there. So let's say I found a vulnerability in developers. Okay, click that. So the asset becomes that. And then you want to type in the type of vulnerability you found. So let's say I have found the cross-site scripting. I'm going to type in cross, and I have found a reflected XSS. I select that. And then here is where the CVSS calculation happens. This is a very subjective thing, but it's a great way to communicate with a security team to make him understand how you have assessed the severity of your vulnerability. You can just go high or critical and just guess. But if you do that, you're not telling them why. This is where you make your case. It calculates it for you. If you're not familiar with CVSS, if you go to hacker101.com uh, on the main site and you go to getting started and you click on this, how to write a good report, we've broken down what CVSS and CWE are. CWE is obviously the earlier step of the vulnerability type. Uh, and then CVSS calculator, you know, you calculate how to... Um, how vulnerable, how your vulnerability is. Is it critical? Is it a medium severity? Whatever else. Uh, and there's some examples for it too. I'm going to try my best to explain these very quickly, but if you want to learn them in depth, please go to that website on hacker101.com and learn it. So first of all, attack vector, how are you accessing this this particular bug? Or you have, do you have to be on a network uh, as in on the internet? Since this is where we are on the internet, I'm going to click network. But if you have to be on a local, so let's say you're hacking on a, maybe a smart device and you need to be in a local uh, environment, in like a local network, you click local. If it's a phone, for example, you have to have physical access to it, you go to physical. But for most of these bug bounty programs, especially when it's web, you're gonna go to network. Attack complexity, very uh, straightforward. Also, you can read the def definitions here too, uh, but pretty straightforward. How hard is it to exploit this thing? So if it's super easy, there's not much, it's slow, but if they have to do a few different, like you have to bypass a few things, you've found some crazy exploit, you go high. Uh, privilege required, it means what kind of account do I need in order for me to exploit this? Do I have to register? If so, can I register on my own or do I need to be invited or do I need to pay for it? Or do I have to be a part of an organization? Or do I have to be an admin, for example, for this to work? So this is where you decide. If you don't have to register, then none. Uh, in some cases, if you can't self-register, you could still be none. Um, if, if you have to be an admin account or an organization owner, then obviously that's going to be high because it requires a higher privilege. Uh, user interaction. Does the user have to click or do anything for this to be exploited other than just linking them to that thing? Uh, so, for example, does the user have to go to their profile, enter something for this to work, or search for something for this to work? Those are where you will have to uh, agree on the user interaction. So we're going to say no user interaction. The scope of this means 
is this bug going to give you access to more than just one thing? So for example, uh, is this going to give you access to a server? You know, can you can you execute commands on a server, for example, or can you pivot through it or whatever that is? You can do change or unchange. We'll do unchange for this one. Confidentiality is pretty self-explained. How much confidential data can you get access to pretty much with this? Uh, and again, with every vulnerability, this definition could kind of change in how you approach it, but I just want to generically just go through all these definitions and talk about them. So let's say with this vulnerability, you get access to their social security number, probably on the higher end, especially if you're able to get everyone's social security number, right? Integrity is, can you modify this data? Could it be trusted? Could it be uh, altered in any way? It could be taken in different ways. We're going to say it's low. And then availability. Can you decline access to this particular site or this functionality through this vulnerability? And if it's low, if it's you know, if you really can do it, then it's high. If it's maybe low, and then if you can't, then it's none. So we're going to say none. And if you go up here, you see it's medium 5.5. And these are what we call the CIAs, this uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These three could dictate how high your vulnerability goes, especially uh, with the scope being changed. So if the scope is changed and all these are high, then it's going to be critical. But if you click on all these, make sure you have an explanation so you can tell the company why you picked these. Uh, and you can do that in the report, and I'll show how you can do that. Because they might say it's not what you think it is. is Correct. Okay? Or they may not understand why you, you know, it, it, the whole thing is, when I write a report, I assume they know nothing about the product and they don't understand anything about what I'm doing. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'm building a case for why they should pay me for a critical vulnerability versus medium by this report. So the title is where you want to communicate what vulnerability you found. So let's say we found Log4j, for example. Log4j um, in business.tiktok.com leads to remote command execution via file.php or like the parameter for it. You want to give them some information about the vulnerability. So where is the vulnerability? What kind of vulnerability? What class of vulnerability? I know we said XSS earlier, but I'm going to change it down here. Uh, what name, if it's a known vuln, what is it? Where is it? And what does it lead to? And I will give a file name or a path and the parameter that's vulnerable. And it doesn't have to be in this order, but these are the information you want to give them because it helps them understand where exactly this vulnerability is. And if somebody else has reported it already, unfortunately for the hacker who is submitting this, it's going to be a dupe, but it helps them find this information faster. The next thing is a description. This is where you talk about your bug. You type in a summary. You can say, I, have, I found a log for j vulnerability while looking at this website. This parameter seems vulnerable. And it gave me RCE, for example. Just a quick, short, you know, 140 to 180 characters, like a tweet. You don't want to write an essay unless it's something really important that you have to reference to. And then the step to reproduce the bug is very important. The way I write this is I go all the way to the beginning and everything that I have to click on. So if it means log in, I go log in to business.tiktok.com. Or even I say register a new account if you need one and log into business. You have to make sure they don't understand what's happening. You want to go all the way to the top and tell them from the beginning. And let's say you have to click on a menu on the right-hand corner. So let's say I have to click on this top button on the right-hand side. I'm going to say click on the arrow pointing down next to your avatar on the top right corner and click settings. And I will also put a link to settings right here. So if I go to settings, this is what the URL is for it. I'm going to go back and I'm going to put that here just so they can also see how that works. So they can directly go to it or they know how to find it. Be just because someone works at a company doesn't mean they understand this particular product completely. Don't assume they know everything. And then you do that all the way through. What did you do? What code did you execute? You know, what payload did you put in? All that stuff goes here. And then if you have any supporting material or references, if you have a good Log4j reference, an article that you learned from and you want them to see, you put it there. And then any screenshots or references go there. And this is where you build your case with CVSS. So what is the impact? With this vulnerability, I can execute command on this side and gain access to X, Y, and Z. This is very, very short because I don't have really a vuln, but the X, Y, and Z is very important. Why are you saying this is confidential and integrity is high? Can you modify data? This is where you put that. You say, hey, with this vulnerability, I can gain access to the server. I can execute commands, which means I can take down the server, modify files, or also access private data that's hosted on this server itself. And once that's all done, you can review your vulnerability here. 
You can click submit. I'm not going to do that here because I want to send them a spam report. But once you send this to them, they will receive a report. And what will happen is they will take a look at these reports and get back to you. There are a few terminology with uh, reports. One is triage. In most cases, it means that they're looking at it, investigating it. It may be valid, but in some cases, it may mean that they've only looked at it and they're still investigating it. So you could come back and say, hey, this is invalid. This is not a bug to us. They could say it's a duplicate. Things may change. A duplicate means that it's already been reported by somebody else. Or unfortunately, internally, they knew about it. And this, it happens a lot of times, but the companies are very, very good at communicating that. They're getting better at it. Informative, it means that thanks for the info. We don't consider this a bug. It's a functionality. It's not, you know, critical enough to us. Uh, it's informative. It's information that we, you know, we like. We're not going to fix it. And not applicable is pretty much, hey, this is completely not a vulnerability. Uh, it shouldn't be reported. It's out of scope, for example. That property doesn't belong to them and that kind of stuff. So you've shown us like how to submit a report that you of a bug that you found. For the actual hacking portion, you're just going to their website and trying things, is that right, for the URLs that are in scope? Correct. For PayPal or for Uber or one of those companies, um, you can basically hack anything on like PayPal.com or Uber.com, is that right? Correct. So let's look at PayPal really quick, just as an example, since you yeah. mentioned it. So this is what PayPal's program looks like. And all the way at the bottom is their scope. So PayPal actually owns some of these other ones like Venmo, Paydent, Braintree Gateway, and PayPal.com. So you can hack on all of these. I enjoy doing this process called recon or reconnaissance. Reconnaissance is pretty much, it's a military term. You want to see what areas are friendly, what areas are not friendly. In our case, we just want to know what areas are owned by this company. One of the ways you can do this is just opening up Google and typing in the site. And that brings up a lot of different PayPal sites. But there's this concept called Google dorking. Google dorking allows you to be very, very specific with your searches. And this is, you know, not just for hacking, but it just becomes very, very helpful when you're hacking. They have this thing called site. You can add this to your search and it will only search within that site, paypal.com. So you can see now it's only giving us PayPal results, WW PayPal. Um, if you click on page nine, it's going to give us WW. What you can do is you can do a minus sign or a tag sign and say, I don't want to see this domain. Oops, wait, let me go back. So I type that in. It no longer shows any of the WWW domains. It now shows me payouts. You can do the same thing with payout or business. So I can go uh, demo because there's a bunch of them down at the bottom. And I'm going to move developer to, right? And that no longer shows those anymore. So you can do this with every domain that you keep seeing come up. And it gets rid of them. You can do other things. So you can actually search for particular things in the URL. So if I want to look for something that's, for example, an admin page, you can type that in. It's going to go to this page, admin, admin, shtml. This thing has a donation with an email admin, but it's very specific, right? It shows you exactly that word. Let's say you want to look for a particular extension. Like you want to look for PHP files. You do extension.php. That's not good. Um, we're going to do JSP. It brings that up for you. So you can click on it and see what those pages look like. If they're still up there, you can actually test them. You can do a number of different things, but those are my favorite ways of quickly looking at an asset. This alone is a really good way to do it. It's pretty much anything that Google has crawled and indexed, but it's not everything. But it's still a good place. This is one of the first things I do when I hack on a new company. Just to kind of get an idea of how big this company is, how big that domain is, what kind of assets do they have, how do they name their assets, and all that good stuff. Do you have like sort of a a game plan or like a way of a process or something that you go through, like this would be one of them. You know, the problem when you're starting out it, it, to get that kind of knowledge and experience can be hard. Yeah, um, absolutely. What's, what's your sort of thinking or game plan? So I use a lot of what's called certification, certificate transparency. Uh, cert transparency is pretty much anytime a company has a new subdomain. So a subdomain is that thing before that, before it comes to the domain. So let me open up a notepad. It's going to be a .com, .net. It could be .cloud, whatever, right? Some companies may own multiple. We, we don't know that. We have to search that and figure out what domains a company owns. And I'll talk about a little bit of that in a little bit too. But I want to talk about what a domain and subdomain is. And then this this is a domain, so it's paypal.com. And anything that comes before this, it's called a subdomain. So www.paypal.com, that is a subdomain. Ads, subdomain. For example, for Google, if you go to drive.google.com, that's a subdomain. Mail.google.com, another subdomain. Docs, subdomains. These are all the subdomains that belong to this Thing. There could also be subdomains of subdomains. We typically call those um, environments. 
It could be something like dev. So it could be mail.dev.google.com. That means that a developer environment that they're deploying new stuff to, which is really important. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But this could be the developer's testing environment that's also accessible to people outside the organization. Sometimes I have new functionalities that you can test. There's sometimes wounds that are in there by default. They're not supposed to be there. They forget about them, all that stuff. And it could also be the other way. It could be what we call a permutation. It could be mail-dev. So that tells me it's a dev site of the same subdomain, mail.google.com, and it has a, so we call that a permutation. So it could be either a dot, which could be a subdomain of the subdomain with an environment, or it could be a permutation of that domain, which is mail dash dash dev.google.com. It will all make sense in a bit, I promise. So what you can do is you can do search transparency. As I was mentioning, this every time a subdomain comes out and every time you go to these domains, it redirects you to, so let's go to mail.google.com. It always redirects you to https.mail.google.com, right? Because that domain has an SSL certificate that also gets logged through the search transparency websites. So people know when a false certificate has been issued for a company, you can see that in there. So everybody's subdomains that have a cert, if they have a cert attached, and again, not every subdomain has a cert, but almost 99% of them do, it gets logged in one of these companies like cert.sh, which they just have a entire list of them. So what you can do is you can actually search for these. So I'm gonna type in paypal.com, and because of how big PayPal is, this may take a while. This percent sign means anything that has this pattern of paypal.com, dot paypal.com, I want you to show it to me. And after a few moments. A few moments later. But it comes back and it gives you these. It gives you a lot of good information. It tells you when was it logged, when was it first seen, it shows you the domain for it, it shows you who issued this, and a ton of different information. What's cool about this is some of these domains may not come up on Google, but you can see every single bit of them. And if you want to look for a dev site, you can type in the word dev, and you can see beta developer is there. Is there a dash dev site? Beta developer, uh, API, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see that. If you found a bug in their developer site, that would be something that you could submit, is that right? Correct, yes. So the developer sites, I personally like to go after the dev sites for multiple reasons. One is because they're, it's built for testing. So if you take it down on accident, it's better than the main site coming down. But B, they're very loose in some cases. First of all, a lot of companies don't want this to be exposed. Some companies don't care, some companies do. If it's exposed, they may have log files, they may have more functionalities, they may be um, looser to test, and it's just easier to test these out. So I always go for these just because it's they're, they're more fun to look at just because of the aspect that it's a testing site that may have information that the regular site, that's a product, product site or a, a, pro, yeah, a, a production version of it, doesn't have that already. Uh, you just so need to make sure, like when you look at the company, the specific company that they allow you to look at all subdomains. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So for cases of PayPal, they do this, but with Yahoo, they were very specific on what you can and you cannot hack. Yeah. So keep that in mind. If you go out of scope, you may not get paid. They may ban you from their program. They, they may be unhappy with you. So just make sure this says it's star dot So you can do all this, uh, and it gives you a list of all these subdomains. Uh, you can use bash, pay, uh, if you're good with Python, you can yeah, write a Python script. So you can actually, uh, if you want the output to be in JSON, because you want to parse it yourself with, uh, if you want it to be in JSON, you want to parse it yourself with PayPal, with um, bash, whatever, you can also do that. There's also something else you can do with this. But before we do this, let's go to paypal.com itself and take a look at their certificate. So you click on that little lock that shows it has an SSL cert. We go to connection is secure and we look at the security certificate. It says valid, we go to detail. There's a few things that are really important to look at. One is the issuer, you can see who issued it. Not really that important. Uh, there's a subject that's really important because the subject here gives you the common name, which is a name for the site, is the organize or organization that owns it, which is PayPal Inc. And an organization could own multiple domains. So if a company like PayPal says, hey, hack everything we own and you don't have a list of domains, knowing who the organization that owns the certificates are is very important because then you can use something like certain other that I showed earlier and list all of the assets based on the organization instead of the domain, which I will show in a bit. And it tells you where it was. The location sometimes could be helpful. Some companies are in very specific 
cities that nobody else is in. Like Netflix is a big one. I didn't know this. Uh, my friend Dylan showed me this actually. And they're in a very, very specific city. There's no other tech companies in that city. So if you do based on city, you find all their internal domains as well. And then there's also the DNS down here you can click on. It gives you more domains that are shared right here. There's other alternative domain names that share the same exact certificate. And it gives you more domains to look at. So it gives you an idea of what other domains they may have. So for example, PayPal Objects is one. Uh, Venmo is one. If you didn't know it already existed, BaintreeGateway.com. But I want to go back to what we just talked about, the subject. And I'm going to copy PayPal Inc. as the organization. And we're going to just jump back into Cert.sh. I'm not doing a lot of hacking, really. It's mostly showing how I find more targets to look at. Yeah. Well, you got to uh, start with that. Correct. So you want to you want to see where it goes. So you go right here, you go to the organization name and you type in PayPal Inc. You can just type PayPal if you want. It should work anyways. Sometimes the names of the domains and companies don't match. For example, Yahoo used to be owned by Verizon Media. Now they're Yahoo again. And they used to be called Oath for a while. So those names can make a difference, especially if you want to find all the assets that they own. Coming up with that name is very important. He just clicked on advanced, yeah? And then it brought you to this page, yeah? Correct. Yeah. There's numbers of ways you can do it. It's just, I want to show the different things you can search by. So now you can see right here, there's a column that says matching identity, which is PayPal Inc. And now we see some other domains like paypalinc.com is one of them. Uh, we'll see some more QA. So remember when I say it might be a dev dot QA is another one. It could be test. It could be a bunch of different things, right? Um, somehow tools that similarity is owned by them. Um, I would do a who is on this domain to make sure it's owned by them and not some other company, but PayPal Corp is one of them. So if you do some, if you're good at programming, if you're good at, if you're good at Bash at least, not even, pay, uh, not even Python, I mean, you can do it with Python too. What you can do is you can dump this into JSON format. So you go output equals JSON. And you can take the domains and then you rerun the first query where it was looking at all the domains, so the subdomains of those domains. So you get a list of all the domains from here, and then you go back to the other search with Bash, where you, you, you code something that automates it, then you get a list of all those subdomains as well. And now you have like thousands of thousands of thousands of domains to look at. I think a beginner would go to paypal.com and try and you know hit that straight away. But what you're trying to do is find like stuff that's more hidden, not Correct. obvious. Yeah. Yeah. You can do both ways. There are some hackers that are really, really good at looking at the core site. And just because the people that have looked at the core site doesn't mean there are no bugs on there. Let me make that clear. These companies are deploying new code every few weeks. New functionality, new changes, new things, right? If you get bored and you want to find some other stuff, go here and look. Like Just typing in admin right now, it's giving us admin PayPal. Like, doesn't mean that you can access them, but there are some admin sites here. Admin that I apply that bill me later. All these different admin sites you can look at. The whole idea isn't to just say, hack on all of these it's just i got i'm i'm bored of you know looking at the core paypal app i wonder what other things they have i'm gonna go look for it i like what you said about looking at dev sites because if it's a dev site they probably haven't done everything they need to to make that code as secure as it should be yeah i know uh so one of the things that i personally do there are a ton of good open source tools out there you can use them to gather more information on all these assets so what i do is usually I get a list of domains, get a list of domains. Uh, I use tools like HTTPX, which is an open source tool on GitHub. Just go to github.com, look where HTTPX will come up. I will feed all those domains. So I, I save them all into like an all domains.txt. And then I feed it into HTTPX. And HTTPX has a lot of different options. It allows you to get the page title. So it tells you what's on the title of this page. So for this one, it says powerful tools for your business. It will grab that for you, every single site for you and show it to you. It will show you if it's accessible or not. It will show you the response code. So if this site, if it requires some sort of an HTTP password, it will tell you that. So if you're not sure what response codes, uh, look into them and it tells you what that response code is when it comes back. If a site is visible, like the one that I have on the screen right now, it comes back as 200. That doesn't exist, comes back as 404 it tells you what that is as a part of it as well you can also take screenshots there's a bunch of different screenshotting tools you can use you can take screenshots at these sites you can say hey i want you to open up this file i want you to do all domains.txt and i want you to screenshot them and you can see what they look like at a high view you can go oh this one has a login i'm interested i want to see what this site does and go after it well that's interesting it all comes down to what you want to do so my if you are very new what i want to recommend to you is go to hacker one there are a ton of different programs you can hack on. There's two sides of this bug bounty thing. Before people in the comments who are bug bounty hunters come after me, please bear with me. I always say this and I always get chased because of it. You shouldn't be doing a lot of work for free. I, I'm, not a, I'm not saying go and give up your, 
you know, your free time and work for free. What I'm trying to say is go hack on programs that are not being hacked on by the pros, by the top million dollar hackers, by the full-time bug bounty hunters. If you're brand new, focus on learning. And I personally think that learning is a lot easier with programs that don't pay you. A lot of people are going to come after me. The top bug bounty hunters hate this piece of advice, but it's real. And I've done this with a lot of my students who I teach, people that I've mentored. I tell them, go hack on a program like GM, Department of Defense, because hackers like me who spend a lot of time on these programs aren't hacking on them because they're not paying bounties. And I'm doing this for money. Um, so let's go to IBM, for example. What I just showed you right here is very important for IBM. IBM is saying IBM products. We don't care which ones, as long as it's owned by IBM. It could be IBM.com or any other websites or domains owned by IBM. So you can do what I just showed earlier and find a list of all the big assets and then go after them and find these websites that you can self-register. So if IBM has this developer sites that's like for businesses, for example, sign up, go on there and look for vulnerabilities. Next thing, find this like expense site that could be self-registered. Make an account. The self-registered sites are the best because there's a reason why they require you to register and have an account. Go on there, look for bugs, look for IDOs, look for XSS, look for um, SSRF, whatever you're good at. Make a list of the top three things you want to learn and learn them while hacking on programs like IBM that have a ton of assets and a ton of the top hackers aren't looking at them either. So in other words, you're saying because the competition is so high for like paid programs and the guys with lots of experience are already there try and go somewhere else where they're not spending their time and your likelihood of finding something is better is that kind of the reasoning correct that's exactly what it is it's just um a program like yahoo don't get me wrong if you can hack on yahoo great awesome make your money no one's going to know to make money but it's going to be a lot harder because they've been around for years if you go to these directory pages there's a lot of companies on there and a lot of people are looking at them but with a company like IBM, it's so huge that even if the pros were looking at them, there's so many assets that you can't even like test them all at once. You can't automate a lot of it. In life, you got to pay often for education. Sometimes, you know, you got to put in the work before you get a return. So I can understand the logic of what you're saying. It makes sense. Uh, Department of Defense, another good one. Who doesn't want to hack the government? They have assets that date back to 2000 and like eight that are still online for some god awful reason. You just got to find them. You see, this is one of our top hackers, CDL. He's still hacking on uh, the problem of defense. If you go to his page, you can see he's checkmarked. He's one of the, the well-known hackers out there. He's a really good dude as well. Very smart. You can see he's hacked on PayPal, Epic Games, Yahoo. But he's still going strong on the Department of Defense too. I do these kinds of programs for research purposes. If I want to make a case for a research, they're a great place to practice. And I still go to them. I think it's like you said. I mean, if you're young and you want to get a job somewhere, putting that on your CV that you've hacked the Department of Defense is, is going to look really good. Absolutely. And they can see here, if we go right here, all hackers, they can see who these hackers are. Uh, and they can verify that you have hacked on their programs before. I got my first job. So I did contract work for a while as a security engineer. My first job was purely because I hacked that company. I sent a report to them and they, they gave me like a, product for a year for free and I ended up working for them because I had hacked on them but on my resume that I submitted for uh, the interview I had exactly this I'd hacked some of these free programs and I said I had found XSS or SQL injections in these programs and I had listed them and that was a great way to show experience because I've hacked real companies um, that have real products out in the world and it's a really good way to showcase your experience as a hacker as well. This is a problem a lot of people face how do you get experience without experience? Companies won't give you a job because they ask for all this crazy experience. But what you're saying here is this is a great way to get experience without having to go through a gatekeeper, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's First of all, it's a good place to learn. I don't think I've ever done a web class or training, honestly. From somebody who's uh, who has products about teaching, I don't believe that you need to do that at all. I think you can learn all this stuff on your own. There's a number of books out there you can read. There's YouTube channels you can follow and watch. There's free content like Hacker 101, the Burp Seed Website Academy. Uh, they're all free. I love calling Bug Bounties the, the playground, research playground. It's where you go and prove that this research, this idea, these bugs, your experience, whatever it is that you're working on is true. You can show that you have this experience to find these vulnerabilities online as well. Some people might find it easier to follow someone. You've got a course, haven't you, that you've created? I've created a course. I, it's, I don't think you need to take, my, I, as much as I'm supposed to be selling my course, you don't need to buy the course. Everything you want to learn with bug bounties is available for free. It's just there's a structured way of doing that. I can't learn from a 
class. I have to do things on my own. I need hands-on experience. The reason why I made that is because people want to learn from somebody in a structured way. Hacker 101 CTF is a really good way to learn and also connect yourself directly to these companies by getting invites to these private programs. The way that you put that is the reason I think everyone should go and buy your course because you're not trying to flog it. It's um, you, you created that to help people. In England, we say it's horses for courses. So different options for different people. Um, so if you like, you know, structured way, then, you know, go and get your course. But um, have you got any books that you could recommend? I have a few. Actually, let me grab them. This one is called the Web Applications Hacker Handbook. What I like to call the Hacker Bible. It talks about all the different vulnerabilities. It's pretty old, don't get me wrong. It's kind of old, but it's the one thing that I recommend to a lot of people. Burb Suite is a very well-known tool that a lot of hackers use. It's by this company called Portswigger. What it does is it sits between your browser and the internet as a proxy. It, every time you do something on the, on the browser, it sends a request and Burp lets you see that request. It tells you the basics of it. I highly recommend it. If you get through this book, you're on the right path. If you want to learn about mobile hacking and Android hacking, this is a good book. Not everyone wants to hack websites, so mobile, Android phones, this is a good one. If you want to learn Python for hacking purposes, pretty small book, really not that, not, not a whole lot to read, but they give you some good examples of how to do things. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out. This was one of the books that I read in my early days. I don't even know why I bought this. I bought this on accident, I think. But it helped me a lot because I was doing a lot of like interviews for um, security engineering jobs. While I knew how these vulnerabilities existed, I couldn't explain how to fix them really. And getting an idea of how to fix things also helps you become a better hacker because you know how to deal with the quote unquote fixes that may be in place and bypass them. These two books, however, are my favorites. This one is called The Real World Bug Hunting by Peter Jaworski, who's a top hacker of a Hacker One. Originally, it was an ebook. So if you do a Google search on Hacker One and you put Peter Jaworski and Web Hacking 101, you get the early version of this book for free. You just gotta, you just gotta do some hacking and Google search for it. I showed you how to search for things. Uh, use that to find this book for free, an early version of it. New version has a lot more data. He talks about different vulnerabilities in here and I'm pretty sure he still uh, has examples of them too. I think he analyzes different vulnerabilities right here. Uh, I, can, I don't think you can see that, but it shows you the bounty amount, the URL, what, you know, the report number and all that stuff. So it actually analyzes how these vulnerabilities work. Uh, this is a recent book. I really enjoyed this. It's by my, my friend of mine. Her name is Vicky Lee. Um, if you're not familiar with Vicky, go to her website. She does an amazing job at writing technical content. I've never enjoyed reading more technical content in my life than reading some of Vicky's uh, blog posts and stuff that she has done. Talks about different vulnerabilities. I think this pretty much covers all the big vulns that are out there from SQL injection to IDOR to recon to remote code execution, access controls. Um, I'm trying to see there's some, some Android apps, API hacking. Uh, it's about 400 pages. A really, really good book. I highly recommend going after this one as well. What order would you would you read in? Like if I was starting and like there's a lot of books, which one would you start with? And then like number one, two, three. Start with this one just because yeah. it teaches you a lot of basics. It's a little bit outdated, but I want to call it like speed read this if you have to. And then the second one would be between these two. So it doesn't matter which one you go after. I would say preferably this one because this is more focused on, you know, what the vulnerabilities are. And it's going to be similar to this one that I just showed. Um, but this is more recent. There is more, you know, more techniques in there, more recent vulns, more research has been done on some of these vulns. Uh, you may get more value out of this reading it in com com combination of the other one. And then once you've read this one, this, the reason why I said read this one third is because this is examples from activity and it explains it and you can understand why these things work because you know the vulnerability types as well. So you can see this one last. And then if you have more time and you want to learn how to code, then I would go to the Python book and then down the list of what I showed earlier. If you like reading, the books are a great way to go. If you like watching videos, Hacker One's got free content that you've created and others have created, is that right? Correct, so you can go to Hacker 101 and learn. Um, there are ton Honestly, there's so many content creators. This is one of the things that I say people, not to sound like an older generation of hackers, but seven, eight years ago when I first started, none of these websites, none of these YouTube channels existed. There were, the only way from learning was 
peer to peer, I would reach out to other hackers who are my friends. Big shout outs to my friends Smeagles, Zayat, um, ZLZ, uh, Donut. There's a bunch of different, NT, there's a lot of different people that I've reached out to in the beginning. It was just learning from each other. And then people were blogging some of their findings. So there were blog posts, you can go read them. Um, you can learn from this activity now, you can read. But those were the only options. Now there's YouTube channels. You have the Stokes, you have uh, Farah, you have like all these different people that make content. I don't want to name specific people. I don't want to forget yeah, I everybody. You, give, us, give us some of your favorites, but I didn't want to put you on the spot. Like give us, I mean, the ones that you, like just that come to mind and we'll just have the disclaimer that it's not everyone. Live Overflow, who I like to call Ed Overflow. He'll get this joke when he sees it. Stoke is one that you have interviewed. His content creation is amazing. The way he comes across on a you know on a on a camera, he's so natural when he explains things. But he does a lot of collaboration with other hackers. Uh, Farah Hawa. I think that's how you say her last name. Uh, she works at Buck Crowd, I believe. She explains different things. Um, she breaks them down and explains them. Katie, Insider PhD. I haven't seen her make a lot of new content. Uh, I think she's busy with work. Uh, she has Insider PhD. The Cyber Mentor he used to make a lot of good content. I don't know if he's doing it anymore. He's got his business going. He has a lot of certifications. If you want to learn about certs and you know learn from a course again, he has them as well. Asset Note is a company uh, as a part of their marketing. They're doing what they call bug bounties uh, redacted. It just started doing that last week when they talk about the bugs that they have found. And then uh, WebSec Academy by Portswigger. It requires Burp Suite, but they teach how to, use, how to use Burp Suite and how to find these different vaults. And it's very, very, it's a very, very good way to learn as well. If you want to spend some money, uh, big shout out to Try Hack Me, Hack the Box, uh, Pentester Lab. There are a lot of different platforms that are learning platforms that you can learn from. CTFChallenge.co.uk is a really good one. Bug Bounty Hunter com is a really good one uh, by Z Shano. Z Shano himself has a really good YouTube channel and content as well. And then last but not least, I also have a YouTube channel if you want to come learn from me. And if you like the stuff that I did also, I do, I'm on a stream. I do mostly streams. I don't make a lot of YouTube videos, to be honest. I like the one-on-one -on -one interaction of doing them live. We've been going for a while and I wanted, you know, I've got a whole list of questions here that I wanted to ask you and we never got a chance for that. But I think we'll we'll, we'll have to get you back for another one. Um, any, last, any last thoughts? And I'll put all your social media stuff below. I'll make sure that people, you know, go and subscribe, please. But any, you know, encouragement, last thoughts for people who, have, who you might find this like overwhelming so if you're watching this and you want to really get into bug bounties go sign up go sign up on hacker one go sign up on bug crowd whatever one looks better to you integrity whatever you like sign up look for a program that you want to hack let's say do you like cars go hack ford go hack gm do you like technology go hack ibm do you want to hack the Department of Defense? Whatever one sounds interesting to you. Doesn't matter who what other people say. What looks interesting to you is the one that you should go after. Because then you have a little bit of passion of wanting to hack that company. And then make a list of ones that you really want to learn. XSS is a really easy one. CSRF, cross-site request forgery, really easy one. Uh, IDOR, really easy one. Those are the three that you, I think you should start with. Go learn those. Go do different, you know, levels at CTFs or whatever one you can get your hands off, go do those offline, learn how they are, learn how to find them, and then find that company that you like and really focus on those three volts. To find a cross-site cross -site scripting, make it your goal. By the end of the month, I'm going to report a cross-site scripting. Write it down, put it out there in the universe and make it happen and go and actually look for those vulnerabilities. Once you get that one first vuln, if it's a duplicate, doesn't matter. You found a valid bug still. It doesn't matter. It's not a race. You found something valid. You should be proud of it if it's a duplicate. But then continue. Build on that momentum and hack and find more vulnerabilities. Ben, thanks so much for sharing your, you know, this is years and years of knowledge and experience. Um, and I really want to talk about your journey a bit more in another interview. So thanks so much for sharing. Of course, thanks for having me. And if you know anybody watching this, if you have any questions, tweet at me, send me an email. Love to help everybody out. I'm happy to help in any way possible. Yeah.